Welcome again to Faces of Sterling. I'm Terry Ackerman, your host. I'm the town administrator in Sterling. Thanks for watching. And today we have a guest from the USDA. Mr. Clint McFarland is here to talk about the Asian longhorned beetle. Welcome. Thanks. I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you today. Remind us, what is this Asian longhorned beetle that we've been hearing about and why is it a problem? The Asian longhorned beetle is a significant problem, especially here in the northeastern hardwood forest, because it is a beetle that feeds on living wood. Mm -hmm. So with this, it goes after hardwood trees. Its most preferred hardwood trees are maples, elms, birches, and willows, of mm -hmm. which a large portion of the forest that surrounds us is made up of. Yes. So it's very concerning to us. When we look at a lot of the industries that can be impacted by this beetle, we look at the maple syrup industry, mm. we look at nursery stock, mm -hmm. we look at the forest products industry, and we look at tourism because mm -hmm. the leaf, uh, leaves of these trees are very vibrant in the They're fall beautiful. for colors. And so a lot of the service industry, a lot of the tourism for this part of the country is tied into these trees. Absolutely. That's just looking at some of the industry and some of the effects to um, our different municipalities, but we also have infested trees uh, up along the Wachusett Reservoir and so this in part then mm -hmm. plays in with our water quality mm -hmm. also with our air quality I've often heard the analogy that these trees are our lungs for the uh -huh. ecosystem here uh -huh. so that's very important for us right. as well and if we go into the larger environmental factors this is also a large part of our carbon sink where the carbon as an element comes back into the ecosystem to be mm. reused so this is very very concerning for all of us okay. we've looked at some numbers before and we have just for cities and towns um, throughout the area where Asian longhorn beetle can establish of looking at $700 billion worth in damage wow. uh, that we could lose. And that's just looking at the cities and towns. Wow. So that's not going out into the forested areas. If we extrapolate environmental um, repercussions of this, we could be looking in the trillions and trillions of dollars. Very oh. serious for us um, at this time. $700 billion, that is serious. It's a big number. Oh. It is a big number. Okay. And so with that, I wanted to show just a little bit here with the sample of wood that we do have, um, we of course don't carry around any uh, infested pieces of wood. This is an old piece of wood, but we do autoclave and uh, treat any pieces that we do use for outreach. Mm -hmm. On this, I just want to show what can happen to a tree and why this is so important for us to eradicate this insect pest. We can see on this piece of wood here, we can see some of the emergence holes. If people have heard about this beetle before, we have emergence holes and they come out perfect. They're about three-eighths of, uh, three of an inch in size, and they're absolutely perfect for where these holes come out. You can also see a little bit of the cambium feeding. The bark is removed from this tree, but we can see some of the cambium feeding in this uh, crescent-shaped wound of where the beetle actually dives in. And so we want to show you here on this piece, which we like to use it as a sample of what's happening to the wood internally here. And so when we open this up, you can see where all the galleries, where the insect is feeding, this insect develops as an immature inside of the tree. So most of its life, uh, develop, life development is spent inside of the tree, and we can see here what it's doing, how it's compromising the integrity of this tree. We like to bring this up because this presents quite a few health and human safety hazards. These limbs are going to come down with this, uh, the integrity being compromised as much as it is from Asian longhorn beetle damage. With this, the ice storm event we had in 08 and 09, also, the October storm event last year, we had around Halloween, any kind of that weight added onto a limb that is this compromised is just going to bring it down. Mm -hmm. So very important for people to realize what we have to lose, not only in the trees as part of the ecosystem to some of these industries, but also the threat that it poses to your property, to uh, your children uh, in playgrounds and parks, but also to uh, vehicles parked on the street. This could be uh, very devastating as well. Let me close this back up. Well, that is quite interesting. I had never heard that much detail before, but now the big question, have these beetles been found in Sterling? The beetles have not 
No beetles Phew. have been found good. in Sterling, good. which is good for us right now. Right now, our regulated area is at 110 square miles. Mm -hmm. With that, we encompass the entire city of Worcester, mm -hmm. the entirety of the towns of West Boylston, Boylston, and Shrewsbury, mm -hmm. and then segments of the town of Auburn and the town of Holden. Okay. With that, this is a fluid line. We started at 16 square miles being regulated back in 08 until we find the extent of the infestation. So we are moving out. We have surveyors, uh, men and women that climb trees, men and women that look on the ground for signs of the infestation. Mm -hmm. That continues. We are still a mile and a half away from the border uh, with the town of Sterling and West Boylston. Okay. The closest find has been down uh, across the reservoir near the Old Stone Church um, coming up along that side near the DCR watershed building. That's the closest and where we're still working right now. But want the opportunity uh, to tell your residents, to tell the public about what they can do, what they should be looking for, uh, because the uh, help of citizen scientists, of the residents out there looking uh, when they walk their pets, when they're out there uh, hiking with their families, picnicking, just when they're outside. Absolutely. Using Absolutely. the outdoors, they can be our eyes and ears and more eyes out there can only help in this kind of circumstance. Absolutely, great. So that's good. There's no Asian longhorn beetle in Sterling at this time. But tell us some more about these beetles. Yep, we've talked a little bit about why the beetle is troubling and what we have to lose, but wanted to talk a little bit more about the actual biology. Mm -hmm. Why we can eradicate this insect pest here from the northeastern hardwood forest. So I'd like to start just with looking at these adults. These adults are a rather large, showy beetle. They're often called the starry sky beetle from the Pacific Rim nations that they come from because it almost looks like the night sky with that onyx coloration and the white spots. It's mm. very, very showy as a, as a beetle, and you can tell my excitement as an entomologist here. But these beetles are only out around the 4th of July holiday at this latitude, and then they're only going to be out through uh, a hard frost. A hard frost is going to kill them off like it does a lot of adult insects hmm. here in this, um, this region. When these uh, insects do come out at the, if around the 4th of July holiday, they're going to procreate, and then the female is actually going to chew egg sites directly into the bark of a tree. From these egg sites that we're seeing here, there's a few on a few different species from birch to maple, but you can see where the female with her mandibles, there's serrations around the side of that. She actually chews right into the bark of the tree. That's amazing. And then she takes her ovipositor, which comes out uh, uh, the back of her abdomen, and injects the egg on the underside of the bark in the tree through mm. this chew spot. So we've turned around down here where you can see sort of the flip of that bark. The egg is about the size of a grain of rice. Mm. And she's going to lay that there to protect it. Now the rest of that life cycle is internal to the tree until it comes back out. It's going to go through several different instars, which is just that grub, that worm-like grub that's inside the tree causing all the damage as it's feeding through the tree. It goes through five instars, and one of the main points we like to emphasize of why we can eradicate this insect pest is because that process, from that egg being laid to it coming back out to an adult, takes one to two years. Wow. So we have a chance to get ahead of this infestation to really eliminate this and to save a lot of our resources, which is important. When those insects do come back out, they will come out the holes that we had looked at before, these perfect holes. We've taken out some of the bark to show an exit hole and also how that's gonna heal over a little bit because the tree's still alive. It's not killing the tree instantaneously. Okay. Another thing I wanted to point out from this is this material up here, which is called frass. It's this insect, like a termite, cannot digest all that cellulose from wood itself. Almost nothing on this planet can digest cellulose on its own. So it's got bacteria and it's got like a termite. Although it cannot digest it all, for us is our glorified word for excrement. But this material is not like a carpenter ant or like working in your wood shop, which would be very fine. Um, this is very coarse, mm -hmm. very stringy, I see that. very indicative. When they are actively feeding through the uh, summer months, you will see this collect at the base of a tree. Mm -hmm. You'll see it collect in the crotches of the tree where limbs come out. Wow. So it might be something to draw your eye that there might be something wrong there mm. and, and something you should key in on. So very important for us uh, to look at this. This is a little bit of the biology mm -hmm. that we are looking at. The one key here is that it's one to two years to fully develop from that egg to that adult which gives us time to actually eradicate this insect pest, gives us a very much start, very different than a lot of other insect pests. So it's conducive to the work that we are doing That's right great. now, which is very, very important. Right. Um, along with this, we also have a very cooperative a program that I want to talk about here right now of what we are doing since the onset of the program in 2008. 
The Department of Conservation and Recreation works very closely, as does the um, uh, Mass Department of Agricultural Resources mm -hmm. here in the Commonwealth mm -hmm. with the federal government, with the USDA. Mm -hmm. We also then partner out with municipalities, such as here in Sterling, mm -hmm. with the other ones that are impacted to make sure that we're all on the same page. This, none of this can be done without working very cooperatively with each other. Right. Since 2008, since we got here, a lot of people know the Greendale and Burncoat neighborhoods in the yes. city of Worcester and what has happened. Yes. When we found this insect in 2008, which was reported by a resident of the city of Worcester that brought it to our attention, it had already been in those neighborhoods for 15 to 20 years at wow, least, really? which is why the collateral damage was so much. Oh, wow. Almost every tree that was a host tree, susceptible tree to the Asian longhorn beetle, to the ALB, was infested. And so very, very devastating. You had over 30,000 trees that were removed in a very small area. Terrible. But now as we move out in our progress, as we continue to survey moving out from the epicenter of the infestation, we have found a lot less uh, as far as the number of trees being infested and the level of infestation on these trees being a lot lower. Mm -hmm. So positive indications. We still are in our delimitation process, which is just finding the boundaries of the extent of the entire infestation in Worcester County. Mm -hmm. But we think from what we're seeing right now in uh, the municip municipalities of Shrewsbury, Boylston and West Boylston uh, that we are finding edges. We're finding limits to uh, how far it has moved. And so I want to make sure people are aware that the cutting that we had to do in the beginning to eliminate a lot of the population that was here is just not occurring at this point. Right. We're going after individual trees that are infested and it's not the same. It's all based on what stage we're at in battling. Uh, this right, insect. so you're making substantial progress. Correct. A number of us have seen traps in Sterling. Can you tell us about that? Yes, and your residents would have seen some traps placed around. We got a grant from the U.S. Forest Service this year uh, through the DCR, the Department of Conservation and mm -hmm. Recreation, to place out a thousand traps in addition to the traps that we work cooperatively with a Penn State uh, Forest Service collaboration. These are placed out there to be first indicators, ah. to try to tell us if a beetle is in the area. I can say definitively right now, because the traps have just come down over the past couple weeks as we're at the end of the adult emergency season, that we did not find anything in the town of Sterling. Yes, that great. It's, we had traps going all the way up to Princeton, Lancaster, Clinton, Upton State Park, Moore State Park. Mm -hmm. We got a wide range, let alone in the regulated area for the municipalities we mentioned earlier. So these traps um, can be effective for us. We actually caught nine beetles in traps this year. Most of those were still localized around the infested area in mm -hmm. the city of Worcester and mm -hmm. the surrounding municipalities. But the one that it did identify us to was that um, infestation on Beeman Street, right in West Boylston, which is our furthest north right now. Uh -huh. So it did. We found of that beetle, we have found 47 infested trees around there since, but it can be a good indicator for us. One point I want to make about the traps, because a lot of people see them out there and they say, oh my goodness, it's going to pull these beetles into Sterling from Worcester. And they have concerns about it. I think it's a good question. Okay. The one thing about that is, I wish we had a silver bullet that was that good yeah. to battle this insect. If you could pull them in and get rid of the population that way, how grand that would be for agriculture on many different aspects, but it's not the case. We play these out there to see. They're set on experimental design 100 meters off center. We have basically seen in contrived laboratory settings that 80 meters is the maximum distance, and that's in a laboratory setting. So we place these out there just to see because we can't survey everywhere at right, once right, right. to help us be a first indicator. Okay, and right. so that's important for us. We're going to continue to use those. They will never be placed sort of on the same line year after year because we want to see is it going to pull in anything. Right. And I use the analogy if uh, people and you know, uh, agri uh, farmers for wheat fields, for corn fields, if they had something that could pull all those insects out as far as a trapping mechanism, less chemicals used, less money spent, right. more for right. their profit right. margin. Absolutely. So we just don't have anything in that regard as far as pulling in beetles or insect pests mm -hmm. at this point. But we have seen some effective results if they're within that range. So it helps to identify if something's out there. We constantly like to look at any kind of emerging technologies. Um, right now, one other big initiative that we're pushing on are the use of detector dogs. dogs. If you've ever gone and flown internationally, you'll see that we as the USDA use a lot of these dogs at our ports of entry, airports to make sure fruits, vegetables, right. meats, other commodities that might be carrying pests are not entering the country. And dogs, with their sense of smell, mm -hmm. are a lot more proficient mm -hmm. than us and can actually pull that out. They use that for bomb sniffing, they use that for agricultural mm -hmm. products. We've sort of taken that thought and said, why can't they sniff out the frass, that excrement 
of the Asian longhorn beetle, and if they can do that, can they chemically tell the difference between that and other wood-boring insects that are native wow. to our ecosystem? We have found that that is indeed the case. Amazing. That they really? can do that wow. on often low levels of this brass material. Wow. So we've been using a couple beagles, a couple um, uh, Labrador retrievers. Really? And they have been out actually working in the field for test trials for the last couple of years. So we have seen some very promising results, mm. but just want to sort of bring that up because we don't stop thinking about what else is there? This isn't a stagnant program. We will evolve with the times. We'll look at other methodologies going to help us, but it's all about the eradication of this insect pest. Absolutely. So what should citizens do in Sterling? It's very important. Citizens can help us out in a large regard to make sure this beetle infestation doesn't move further out. Great. And also just to help us to be on the lookout. So the one big thing, the one big theme because this insect is developing inside the wood, mm -hmm. inside this woody material. Mm -hmm. Firewood is very, very big here in New England. A lot of firewood. people use it. Mm -hmm. And because we don't burn that firewood, as soon as we cut it, we cure that firewood, allowing maybe a year, some time, depending on where that insect is in its development, it still mm -hmm. has a chance to emerge out um, after that firewood has been moved. So this is one thing we say to everybody is, don't move firewood. It's be very cognizant of what you are doing. We have seen spot infestations out in Holden, Shrewsbury, uh, some of the immediate uh, surrounding areas to the city of Worcester solely because the movement of firewood. Homeowners have realized it. I know we want to be chivalrous at times. We want to take firewood to grandma and grandpa's house. We want to help out our neighbor, but the repercussions, the ramifications of that are extraordinarily severe because this insect does not move very quickly on its own but we as humans can move at any amount of distance almost overnight. So very, very key for us not to be moving any of this firewood. That's a big thing for us. It's a big push for us with uh, emerald ash borer just being found in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts as well. Mm -hmm. There's gonna be other restrictions with that, but firewood is the really big thing where people can watch. It's sort of the whole new thing of buy local, burn local, and let's just be aware of what we're doing because we as humans can really, uh, really exacerbate this situation quite a bit. Okay, so buy local, burn local, mm -hmm. right. And so also with this, we have a lot of look-alike insects that are out there yes. that are native to our ecosystem, that are just parts of uh, uh, what is naturally occurring, whether that's decomposition and feeding, but are all natural parts to make our ecosystem healthy. Yes. On this, we do have a lot of flyers as we get a lot of different phone calls mm -hmm. on different look-alike insects. Mm -hmm. And these are some that on the uh, Mass Department of Agricultural Resources website, and we also will give uh, more handouts to the town here for mm -hmm. individuals to pick up if they want. They can see a color uh, document exactly describing these insects that are here. But you can see in the upper corner the size of the Asian longhorn beetle, how different it looks compared to right next, we get a lot of most of our calls are for the white-spotted pine sawyer. The white-spotted pine sawyer does decompose and break down pine woods and it's out there. It's a very large part of our ecosystem and very necessary. But you can see the coloration is very, very close. It's got the white spots, it's got the black, it's just its coloration is not as sharp mm -hmm. and the size is going to be smaller. Mm -hmm. We also have here a northeastern sawyer. You can see how the coloration and the antenna look almost the same. This fall side click beetle over here, uh, very, very close with the coloration, white and black spots. And then also down in this corner, I wanted to mention the Western conifer seed bug. A lot of people are seeing this right now and as, it has, as it has been emerging. It's a later uh, emerger than Asian longhorn beetle, but it's out there still right now. Okay. They've been out there for the last couple months, but uh, just so they could tell the difference. Oftentimes people don't look at insects and really look at their detail and how different they are, right. but you can see from looking at something like this how very different they are and mm -hmm. uh, what we're actually trying to get after because uh, this one will devastate a lot of things here if we don't keep it in check. So Clint, I also understand that you're hiring now, is that right? That is correct. Both the DCR and the USDA as part of this cooperative eradication program are hiring and that basically is rolling. If people are looking for opportunities, we are looking for scientists, technicians, officers, administrative personnel, foresters. Having said all that, a lot of that is uh, heavily based on science, but they don't have to have scientific backgrounds. They right. just have to have an enthusiasm for working outside, a little bit of this environmental work. They can go for DCR jobs on the mass.gov uh, website. Everything mm -hmm. will be posted there. For any of the federal positions, they have to go on USA Jobs, one word, usajobs.gov, and all federal service jobs are posted there. So how can citizens get in touch with you if they have more questions? 
Sure, it's important that people have an outlet to get to us. We have a website. It's at Beetlebusters, one word, Beetlebusters.info. They can upload pictures there. You can send things to us. Also, we have two different phone numbers where you can reach our office here in Worcester County. One's a hotline at 866-702-9938, or you can call us at our Worcester County main line. Both are going into the same place, 508-852-8090. But very, very important uh, for you individuals, the residents, to be the citizen scientist. You can really help us out by being our eyes out there to see if there's anything suspicious on your property. So if you do have a suspicious insect that you found, or you do have some suspect damage to a tree, please get in touch with us. We'll get back to you within 24, 48 hours. We just want to be part of this education process with you and make sure that we do realize eradication of this beetle in a very timely fashion. Well, thank you, Clint McFarland from the USDA for being on the show. I really appreciate it. Thank you. It was a great show. And thanks, everyone, for watching. I'm Terry Ackerman. I'm the town administrator in Sterling. This is Faces of Sterling. We'll see you next time.